Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Nerio. I'm a director of research programs at the CUNY Office of Research, and I am the director of the CUNY Research Scholars Program. This series is a part of that program. It is a series for the CUNY, uh, the entire CUNY community, and it is especially targeted at the CRISP Tech Fellows, which is a new program in our office. Uh, all of the tech fellows we believe are now joining us uh, to in today's uh, series and we welcome everyone else that is uh, here with us. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dolorem Karubai, who uh, I've had the pleasure of working with pretty closely in the past and she remains a great friend of the CUNY Research Scholars Program. And I am going to turn the floor over her, over to her. She can introduce herself and then begin uh, the lecture. At any point that people would like to enter questions into the chat, please do. You're absolutely welcome. And we should have plenty of time to get to those questions near the end of Dr. Karubai's talk. Uh, Dr. Karubai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nerio. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining me uh, for this lecture. And thank you so much, Dr. Nerio, for this kind invitation. It's been always a great pleasure to work with you. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. OK. Uh, do you see my, my, my slide changing? Yes, we do. Great, great, thank you. So today I'm going to speak about artificial intelligence, security, and uh, quantum computing and the interactions between them. I first uh, start with uh, AI. Uh, what is AI? What can it be done? And in general, the AI era. Then I speak about uh, cybersecurity, quantum era, and the impact of uh, AI for post-quantum cryptography. Artificial intelligence is a transformative technology that mimics human intelligence, enabling machines to learn, reason, and solve complex problems. Its roots trace back to the 1950s with the term artificial intelligence first coined by John McCarthy in 1956. Over the decades, AI has evolved from simple algorithms to advanced machine learning and deep learning, fueled by vast data availability and powerful computing resources. Today, AI impacts every industry from enhancing medical diagnosis to driving autonomous vehicles and continues to push the boundaries of what machines can achieve. This uh, presentation uh, explores AI's journey from its inception to its current state as a um, cornerstone of technological advancement. So here uh, I introduce the three key areas of artificial intelligence that have been instrumental in its development and widespread application. Medi machine learning is at the core of artificial intelligence, providing the foundation for systems to learn from data, improve from experiences and make decisions. Deep learning, a more advanced subset of machine learning, mimics the human brain's neural network to process data in complex ways, enabling breakthroughs in image and speech recognition. Natural language processing allows computers to understand and interact with humans in their language, transforming how we interact with technology. These areas not only represent the current state of AI research and application, but also guide the direction of future advancement. 
So now let me uh, tell you a little bit about a couple of applications of AI. I'm sure you all uh, know about them. So we first start with the healthcare. In healthcare, AI is revolutionizing patient care with predictive analytics, enabling early detection of diseases and personalized treatment plans. Robotic surgery augmented by AI enhances precision in operations, minimizing recovery times. And as you all know, AI has a lot of applications in finances. So in finance, AI transforms how we interact with money from algorithmic trading that optimizes investment strategies to advance fraud detection systems, protecting our assets. Personalized banking services powered by AI offer tailored advice, improving customer satisfaction and financial health. So here we address the key challenges facing artificial intelligence today, emphasizing ethical considerations, bias and privacy concerns Ethical dilemmas arise as AI systems make decisions that affect human lives, highlighting the need for frameworks that ensure these technologies are aligned with societal values. Bias in AI is a critical issue as data used to train AI systems can reflect historical inequalities leading to discriminatory outcomes. Finally, privacy is a paramount concern as the data that powers AI advancements can also infringe on individuals' privacy rights. Addressing these challenges is essential for the responsible development and deployment of AI technologies requiring a concerted effort from developers, policymakers, and global community. So after this um, brief introduction about artificial intelligence, I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computing, post-quantum cryptography, and how they help each other to what we want to do. So I start with uh, quantum computing. Quantum computing represents a fundamental shift in our approach to data processing, exploiting the unique properties of quantum mechanics to perform calculations at speeds unattainable by classical computers. At the heart of this technology are qubits or quantum bits which are the basic units of quantum information. Unlike traditional bits, which are strictly binary, qubits can occupy a state of zero, one, or any quantum superposition of these states, enabling them to perform multiple calculations simultaneously. This capability known as quantum superposition along with quantum entanglement, which allows qubits to instantiately influence one another regardless of distance, underpins the potential of quantum computing to solve complex problems from drug discovery to cryptography far more efficiently than current technologies. Understanding the basics of quantum computing and the role of qubits is essential to appreciating the vast potential and challenges of this emerging field. The advent of quantum computing represents double-edged sword while it offers unprecedented uh, computational capabilities, it also possesses a significant threat to exciting to existing cybersecurity frameworks. Quantum computers with their ability to solve complex mathematical problems such as um, much faster 
than classical computers could decrypt many of the encryption algorithms currently in use, such as RSA and ECC. I will tell you a little bit about this uh, a bit later, which secure everything from online transactions to confidential communications. This vulnerability underscores the urgency of developing and implementing post-quantum cryptographic solutions that can withstand quantum computing attacks. The global response to this threat has been proactive with various governments and organizations dedicating resources to research and develop of uh, quantum resistant encryption methods. So here we highlight the critical challenges quantum computing possesses to digital security and ongoing efforts to safeguard data privacy and integrity in the quantum era. So I will tell you here about uh, quantum threat. So in 1994, um, an MIT professor, Professor Peter Shor, came up with a quantum polynomial time algorithm for factoring. So what is it good for? So the current, a lot of current crypto systems are based on so-called RSA encryption or public key encryption known as um, by three mathematicians, Rives, Shamir, Adelman. And uh, the hard problem, so you know that um, a cryptographic system, a public key encryption is based on a so-called one-way function, which is easy to compute and hard to find the inverse. And by easy to compute, we mean in polynomial time and hard to compute in say exponential time. So in so the RSA 2020 2048 bit uh, with classical computer can be broken say around 400 years. But with Peter Shore's quantum algorithm, um, this crypto system can be broken in say matter of hours. So in the recent years, um, the development of quantum computers has been very active and it's one of the national priorities. So let's look at some um, risk status. So it means that if you have powerful enough quantum computers to deal with uh, large um, quantum bits, quantum bits then it's possible that the current crypto system will be in serious danger. So here is a graph that you could see, sorry, here is the graph that you could see about the development of what's going on. So this is a scaling IBM quantum technology. In 2019, they could do 27 bits, qubits, which is very small, you know, and then, 2020, 65 qubits, but then look, in 2023, it's 1,121 qubits, which is still not enough for us, but um, the researchers predict um, in, the, in the coming years, in say eight to nine years, um, the industry and government can, can make um, quantum computers of order one million quantum bits and beyond. What is the danger for that? So there is a research by Gidney and Ekera that uh, writes about how to factor 2048 bit RSA integers in eight hours using 20 million noisy qubits. So as I said, RSA is based on prime factorization meaning that if you multiply two large numbers, it's very fast. But if you want to break it to its um, prime factor, it takes a really long time. As I said, it could be 400 years or so. So this paper says if you, if you can have 20 million qubits, then you can break RSA 2048 in eight hours. So it puts 
uh, all our security data in danger, of course. Let's look more closely at the risk, uh, risk status. So when you look at this graph, you see how, um, how we will reach in eight to nine years to break the RSA type of cryptography that we are using 2048. So there is also another danger known as store now decrypt later. So let's say for now, we don't have powerful enough quantum computers. So uh, our security systems are still under control, but say um, that it's possible that um, they can store our private data now and when in in eight to nine years that we have powerful enough quantum computers, they can decrypt and access the sensitive data that we needed to be secure. So what is the solution for that? So the solution is post-quantum cryptography, hard problems secure against the quantum computers. So by post-quantum cryptography, we, we mean that crypto systems cryptographic systems in which they stay secure, even if powerful enough quantum computers will be invented. So as such, we need new hard problems that quantum computers cannot break them. So there has been several proposals, for example, lattice space proposal, which is um, based on shortest vector problem is a mathematical hard problem, hash-based, code-based, and multivariate-based and group-based are those topics that I currently working on. So after Snowden's revelation in 2016-15, the National Institute of Standard and Technology uh, made an announcement for competition um, for, for uh, the, the community mathematicians, computer scientists, physicists to submit proposals for crypto systems in which they are quantum secure. So as such in 2016, US NIST says, quantum risk is now simply too high and can be no longer ignored. So there has been ongoing process for new quantum resistant cryptographic standards through National Institute of Standard Technology. The first one, the first round was in 2016 to 18. Then cryptographers started attacking each other's crypto systems and like uh, one by one, some, some of them were eliminated. And finally in um, July, 2022, uh, NIST uh, made the announcement for the fourth round. And as such, um, there was one um, um, public key encryption known as Crystal Kyber, which is lattice-based, and three digital signature schemes, the Lithium, Falcon, and Sphinx has been, uh, has been selected. So, Let's look at the more and more regulated context and the importance of this topic. In January 22, there was a memo uh, that was released on improving the cybersecurity of national security. The same year in, ja in, ja in December, there was another memo on quantum computing cybersecurity preparedness act. And March last year, uh, there was a release of the National Cybersecurity Strategy. One of the object, strategic objectives is shift liability for insecure software products and services. And another one, prepare for our post-quantum future. So in 2022, NIST made a new um, call for competition this time for so-called digital signature schemes. 
So these are not digitized sign signatures, but they're cryptographic digital signatures and digital signatures have many, many applications, including um, uh, one of the applications is distinguish distinguishing uh, human written text versus uh, machine written text in uh, generative AI, such as chat GPT, BARD and, and so on and so forth. So here I make an announcement that together with uh, uh, three co um, collaborators, I submitted to this competition and uh, my our uh, algorithm, our digital signatures called Biscuit, shorter MPC-based signatures from um, POSO and it's a new multivariate-based digital signature scheme based on the hardness of solving a set of generic structured algebraic equations. And it so far is still in the competition. There has been some attacks and we addressed all of them. So here I mentioned about a little bit. So let's go back to the impact of artificial intelligence for post-quantum cryptography. How uh, it can be used or threaten the post-quantum crypto systems. So here I mentioned about a work I did with my former PhD student, Professor Jonathan Gryak, who's currently assistant professor at Queens College and distinguished professor Robert Harlick at Graduate Center in Computer Science. So what we did was we solved the mathematical problem that is hard, um, uh, with using AI, using machine learning algorithm. In particular, uh, we did this in 2020 and um, we used so-called conjugacy decision problem. And this is has been used for some of the proposed so-called group-based crypto systems. A year after, a couple of British mathematicians, Cravan and Woodward, use our uh, analysis to crypto analyze um, the proposed crypto systems using these hard problems. Because artificial intelligence can also, as we talked about, can solve the complex problems and including mathematical problems. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the chosen NIST uh, candidates for standardization was call, is called Crystal Kyber Crypto System, which is one of the uh, using the lattice space. It's a shortest vector problem or learning with error are two hard problems in mathematics. And uh, interestingly enough, in February 23, some months after the announcement of NIST, um, a research team from Royal Institute of Technology, KTH in Stockholm, Sweden, um, found the AI attack for this um, to crack the NIST recommended post-quantum uh, post encryption algorithm. So you see how impactful AI could be for our security, even for the ones that um, are conjectured or proposed to be post-quantum after many years. So a few months after, a group of researcher from Meta AI, led by Professor Christine Lauter, um, came up with a series of papers of using AI to attack the other lattice space crypto systems uh, that has been proposed for standardization. So this is one of the danger basically to, to our security systems. So we have to, we can actually use it um, for our benefit, for example, we could come up with the more secure uh, parameters for the crypto systems that we are proposing. But 
this is a serious um, problem that researchers currently are working on it. Another part of the talk that I want to address is um, pattern recognition, artificial intelligence over encrypted data. So what does it mean? So let's look at this picture. So you know that um, companies, they have their uh, data, they have uh, their private data, but sometimes they don't have their, uh, they, don't, they don't have their data centers to do the computation, complex AI computation or statistical analysis over this data. So what they do is they save their data in some clouds like Amazon or you know, other cloud services. So they save it there. And so these are very sensitive data. So they have to encrypt their database when they save it in the cloud. But then there are security concerns um, and also efficiency concerns. So if the company wants to ask some information from the cloud, uh, they have to download the data again, decrypt it, and do their computation, and then upload the data again. So this takes a lot of time, and it's not efficient at all, especially if you deal with huge amount of data. So there is a solution for it, cryptographic solution for it, known as fully homomorphic encryption scheme. So in a way, mathematically, it's so if you have an encryption function E, which is so-called homomorphic with respect to addition and multiplication, you call it fully homomorphic encryption. And by homomorphic, I mean E of A plus B is equal to E of A plus E of B, and E of A times B is E of A times E of B. So in this picture, suppose, so what does it offer for us? This is extremely powerful functionality. So suppose you have a genome data company that saves its database in some cloud here, and now, the company wants to know whether client M is in this cloud. So suppose client ID is M. So instead of a company asking the cloud whether uh, M is in the cloud, it asks, do you have E of M? So the cloud doesn't even know what the company is searching for. So the cloud send an answer, yes or no, and searches for EM and send yes or no. And the genome company can decrypt the answer and uh, find what they were looking for. So so-called FHE is very powerful in a way that it can allow us to do data analysis. We can do AI over encrypted large data. In particular, you can also do uh, polynomial calculation or other complex AI algorithms. So let's look at one application. Let's look at the healthcare application. A wealth of medical data is inaccessible to researchers and clinicians due to Privacy Restrictions Act, such as HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And in Europe, they deal with GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. So the medical institutions and companies who own medical information systems wish to keep their models private when in use by outside parties. Clinicians would benefit from access to predictive models for diagnosis, such as classification of tumors as malignant or benign without compromising patients' privacy. So the goal and 
functionality that we have here for FEG is the following. So the goal is secure, accurate, and efficient machine learning or AI computation and function evaluation over encrypted data. So in this picture, in this picture on the left side, you see you have the, for example, a hospital and hospital, they have their own patient privacy regulations. And they have a database D that is uh, contains all the private information. And on the right side, you have the research center and they have intellectual property protection for their algorithms that they are developing. But the hospital wants to know uh, about uh, some pattern recognition, say, about the data of their patient. For example, if a patient has such a such blood pressure, if it's uh, such a such gender in this age and so on, therefore is prone to have such cancer and so on. So this is very important information, but because they have, for example, HIPAA regulation, they cannot share it with the research center and the research center, because they have intellectual property protection, they don't want to share their algorithm. So what's been done here is that um, the hospitals send the encrypted database. In other words, if D is the database, they send the E of D, encrypted database. And the research centers run an algorithm over this uh, encrypted data, as you could see in this graph, and send this to send the analysis to the hospital and because the hospital could encrypt the decrypt the data then they can find the helpful information that they are looking for so this is the powerful idea of fully homomorphic encryption scheme and how it can provide secure private and safe AI for us and how we can access important um, databases and information without compromising the security. So here the possibilities are the following, training a model on encrypted data, evaluating functions on private data while preserving Privacy research center can determine anything, cannot determine anything about private patient database D and another pre they are preserving also the intellectual property. Hospital cannot determine anything about clinical decision support models. So in 2020, 2019, with the help of uh, Office of Research Support, we made a patent um, together with my former PhD student, Halam, uh, who is now a senior cryptography engineer at Oracle. She also studied at Queens College before Graduate Center and my colleague at City College, Professor Spirein, uh, we proposed a fully homomorphic encryption scheme using mathematical combinatorial algebra. And uh, this was also supported by the Department of Defense and also for commercialization, we got some grant from the National Science Foundation from the i program. So you see on the right side, Alex, Alexander Wood was my former PhD student at CUNY Graduate Center. And we col started collaborating with University of Michigan, the Computational Bioinformatic and Medicine Group. So we used our algorithm for the FHC that I mentioned in this slide. Um, to write a paper on private naive based classification of personal biomedical data application in cancer data analysis. So with the help of our algorithm, fully homomorphic encryption algorithm, the researchers were able to access private data without knowing, learning anything about and just get some analysis from them. So you will see how all sciences are related surprisingly from algebra to cancer research. 
So as a report for our company startup, CUNY startup that we made, we called it InfoShield. So the first um, secure um, fully homomorphic encryption scheme was, um, was invented by um, the genius Greg, Dr. Greg Gentry, who wrote his thesis, PhD thesis at University of Stanford on, uh, on this topic. And he proposed a encryption, fully homomorphic encryption scheme, uh, which IBM uh, started working on it. I think still is uh, open source if you want to take a look. Um, so that was the first implementation of fully homomorphic encryption scheme, but it's not practical. So in other words, one multiplication, it, it does computation for one multiplication per second. While our company, our CUNY startup, our computation is much faster, is 500,000 times faster and 1 million multiplication can be done in 0.2 seconds. And I like to note that this company was sold a couple of years ago. So here I stop the talk. I thank the grant agencies throughout the years who supported my research, including RF CUNY and other um, CUNY and external um, funding agencies. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Karobai. And uh, really, really great and interesting talk that gives us lots of food for thought. Um, we'd like to see if we can get some questions going here in the chat. Uh, so we have one from Timothy. Is there any computational speed trade-off when trading an, an encrypted data that you experienced? Thank you very much for this great question. This is a really interesting question. So indeed we did uh, some uh, comparisons between uh, when training the data over encrypted data versus unencrypted data, uh, comparing both efficiency and accuracy. And um, the error and uh, the error is very negligible and uh, it works really fast also. So um, a, answering your question is the speed up is, the efficiency is huge and, uh, and the error is, is um, negligible. So while we're waiting for other questions in the chat, I want to ask you something maybe very basic uh, as a kind of lay person to these questions, which is um, you mentioned how rapidly this technology is developing and you raised some of the potential security threats that it poses. Then you covered some of the efforts to uh, sort of ensure against these threats. I, as we read more and more about AI and you we, we sort of sort of see AI pessimism in some quarters, and then we see optimism in other quarters. As you look at the future, would you regard yourself as an AI optimist overall or an AI pessimist or somewhere in between? Excellent question. Absolutely, yes, I'm an optimist. I think uh, if we learn uh, enough about artificial intelligence and capability and functionality it offers us, we could basically use them as our personal assistant. You have access to personal assistant and you can basically organize a AI system to work for you um, for anything. So I don't see it as a danger. Is You deal with uh, assistants that are more intelligent than you, not, not, I'm sorry, not you, us, human, <laughs> <laughs> my apologies, human being. Um, and the amount of data that it can analyze is not comparable with the human mind. And our job would be to see how we can use it and 
how yeah how how we can get help so it's i'm i'm an optimist for this okay so that leads me to follow up with another question which is um if this technology is capable of being like a personal assistant because in some ways it's more intelligent than than we are or able to compile more information at a time than we are i i was listening to i listened to all the ai podcasts that i can and so one was sort of predicting that that's going to make those of us who are engaged in intellectual labor uh it's going to sort of make the value of our human labor uh, reduced severely, maybe even reduced to zero. What do you think about that pre prediction? Will it replace us? Again, great question. So as a human who we are basically um, leading the technology, leading this AI or personal assistant, we are, in a way, we are more intelligent. And it's correct, I would say, the type of jobs that we are doing, it may change, the kind of jobs that we are doing, it may change. But new job opportunities will be coming, coming. And how we can gain more information about you know, let's look at research. Let's look at the research project that we are doing. How do we do that? So first we read the literature, we learn about what's been done in the literature, and then we start attacking the problem that we want to solve. So suppose that you have an AI system, you have a generative AI, uh, open AI, I don't know, ChatGPT or BARD or whatever, uh, you have that has access to all the literature that has been written in this area and can get all the information and compile it with, for you and then brainstorm with you the uh, what the problem that uh, you're you're planning to solve. So in a way, it's. Um, in a way, it takes some jobs from you to, from us that read the literature for one year, some months, and so on, and it makes it fast, uh, basically in five minutes, faster than five minutes, they, they answer us uh, all this information. So in a way, it replaces some, uh, some of the jobs that we're doing, but, uh, that, uh, but instead we will have new jobs. So for example, we don't need to know about how the AI, I mean, not all of us, I'm interested to know about how AI algorithms work using mathematical structures, but we don't really need to know much about how it works. We need to know how we can use it, how we, we ask questions, because the output of the, of the chat is usually how the way we, train it and, and ask for the answer. So for the students who are listening uh, to you speak, you sort of then are predicting that their future is sort of, uh, you know, kind of a wealth of opportunities uh, are going Absolutely. to be produced by Absolutely. AI. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So I encourage my own uh, students. I'm, I'm teaching at Queens College and I'm encouraging my students to learn about um, using Gen AI and all the capability to make themselves ready for the workforce in the future. Uh, okay, thank you so much for that. We have a question from Brandon. Uh, do you think we will get to 1 million qubits sooner than later? From 2022 to 23, the amount of qubits doubled. It looks like things are moving faster and faster, the more that time passes? Excellent question. Um, so the statistics that I provided is based on the researcher's prediction. And the prediction is that in eight, nine years, we will have, we will, we will, we will achieve the 20 million. So, um, 
all the governments in the US, in UK, in Europe, this is uh, one of the national priorities and they are working, uh, the researchers, companies, government, they're all working uh, to, to develop powerful quantum computers. So I'm optimistic that we'll achieve this. And I like to also make a note that um, quantum computing or quantum computers are going to help us with AI also to, uh, because you have algorithms that you want, the goal of algorithms always to achieve efficiency. And if you have pow more powerful computers, you can, um, you can uh, analyze the larger data in a faster time. Great, thank you so much. And Brandon followed up with, uh, he just wanted to sort of weigh in and say, uh, yes, there are opportunities, right? The, the position of prompt en engineer didn't exist five to 10 years ago. Uh, more types of these kinds of positions will, will come on board. I do want everyone uh, listening in to know that we will be having a panel on May 6th uh, about exactly these kinds of developments. So we'll have uh, five, we might even have six speakers who will be talking about the kinds of opportunities that are opening up due to, uh, due to AI. Uh, let's see, do we have more questions? Would anybody else like to pose a question? So uh, it is a Friday fairly late in the afternoon. Uh, people might be uh, getting ready to um, to have a you know a nice weekend. So um, oh, we do have uh, one more from Brandon. Um, how are we going to deal with things like AI hallucinations? That's a very interesting question. It's actually <laughs> funny when I ask ChatGPT and it gives me an answer I know is wrong. Um, so as you could see. Um, I think ChatGPT came in, in December 2022, isn't it? And in over a year, you see how much, how better it is, you know, compare ChatGPT 3.5 with ChatGPT 4 and see uh, the error is, uh, is just less and less. And now you have also Gemini, um, Gemini Bard with Google that it also does other things better. So you see that it's getting better and better with more accurate information. And one of the challenges for um, the AI researchers is to address the verification of data and hallucination. So I have no doubt that soon this problem is going to vanish sooner and sooner. Um, yeah, and at the same time, uh, the machine is intelligent. So you asking questions or interacting with it, train, train it as well. So I I believe it's going to. Researchers are going to address it soon. Uh, Tamor is asking, do you think it's possible for almost all, if not most, intellectual labor to go out of demand, being replaced by AGI or ASI? Um, I, I mean, it, it's really hard to predict the technology, um, how, you know, in my age, how did I know in, I could, I could find all the information in a small, uh, telephone, right. In, in the small mobile, um, when I was a student, I had to go to the libraries and search for even simple things that I was looking for. So it's hard to predict the future, um, but it seems technology is moving faster than faster than what we think. So I would say it's possible. Brandon raises a, a, an interesting point. So he says that ChatGPT4 is amazing but I can't afford it. <laughs> uh, and actually I read an article recently suggesting that that may also be a future development that uh, that some of the most advanced AI may start to become unaffordable 
even to say academic people who are earning a, a fairly decent salary, but they are not or earning the sort of, um, they don't have the resources that corporations will have. Uh, do you think that that's a possibility? Um, well, recently, in a, I read in an article that um, there are some universities in the United States which are partnering with OpenAI for education, and it allowed their staff and students to use it for free. So at the same time, it's, uh, yeah, so I, I would say in the companies and um, and educational universities, uh, we're going to have access uh, for free. And also, I have to say that if you're passionate about programming, you can make your own system. You can make also your own system. And um, yeah, so I, I think soon we all have to adapt. And the sooner we learn, the better uh, you can catch up with, uh, with the workforce and everything else about it. Great. Um, now, Tamar asks, uh, Claude 3 Opus has been displaying signs of sentience. And uh, what do you think about this? Are, is AI going to become sentient? Or is it already? Um, I have to think more about it. Be careful of how to answer that. So I'm sorry, skip this question. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Brandon then says, I'm getting scared, Tamar. Uh, so uh, that is, I guess, something that that people are beginning to think about. And I think maybe you're quite wise to say, we're not going to answer it quite yet, because uh, we'll sort of see what starts to develop. Uh, okay, we're reaching the end of our session. And I uh, this has been really great, Dr. Karobai. Uh, really good discussion. Um, we'd love to have you back. I think we can uh, continue this maybe in the fall or in the spring of next year. I want to let everyone in the audience know that we've got uh, two more of these uh, uh, sessions coming up before the year ends. I'm sending, uh, I, I'm sending you right now uh, in the chat the, the website to the AI lecture series. This provides the time and the link. The next session is going to be on uh, human robot collaboration. And um, we have a couple more questions coming in. I'll just finish what I'm saying and then we'll get to those questions. Uh, and then what's not on the website is our big panel on AI and career opportunities. That'll go up soon. That'll be on uh, May 6th, but we will send all of that information to everyone who has registered for this series. So in the meantime, uh, Brandon asks, does your class for post-quantum cryptography go more into this sort of thing? Uh, yes, yes. So I'm teaching, I don't know what college I'm teaching. Uh, this is my second semester. I'm teaching uh, post-quantum cryptography for advanced students and master's students at Queens College. I think one of my students, Ashir, is already on the, on the call. So yes, so we go over more details about quantum computing, various aspects of uh, post-quantum cryptography and the standardization. I'm also currently um, advising 10 CUNY students um, on post-quantum cryptography, generative AI, and the impact uh, and interaction between them. And I'm also accepting intern um, for the career launch that is a great uh, initiative by CUNY. So if you'd like to work with me, I'm more than happy to work with smart CUNY students. That's very generous. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, one question that has come up from uh, Aisha, do you think that ChatGPT is making study standards low? For the education? I think that's what they mean. So as a, as a faculty member, do you, do you worry that ChatGPT is leading students to, to study less and to rely on generative AI? Um. 
So as I mentioned before, I'm an optimist and I am in, at Queen's College, I'm in a committee that um, to see how ChatGPT could help with, with our teaching um, duties or, you know, for students and all that. And one thing could be, we need to change the way we assess, assess the students. So we have to have new ideas. For, for example, in my post-quantum cryptography class, I let the student, I encourage the students to use chat GPT-4. So I think it's like the transition that we had, for example, from um, our generation to, to my parents versus the new generation, you know, we didn't have Google at the time and the way we studied and now you have Google. So this is another step further and we are gonna adjust it. So I I think students still going to work harder. They probably need to learn different curriculum than what's been going on now. And a lot of universities already trying to adapt to the new Gen AI era. Some optimism before the weekend starts is that a, it is a great <laughs> thing. Um, so, uh, some students are asking if they wanted to intern with you. Uh, is that a possibility? And if so, where would they apply? How would they apply? Um, with pleasure. As I said, um, the students that I'm uh, supervising um, on Gen AI and Quantum are career launch, spring forward interns. And they also asked me, Huni asked me to work with them in um in the in the steering summer so i would say check out the cuny website and the internship opportunities and i'm very happy to work with you all and perhaps through the program that dr nerio is directing maybe those are also some opportunities happy to be a mentor yes so we've already invited you to mentor at Queens College through the Transfer to STEM Student Success Program. So that's one option. And our brand new ASIRA program, which everyone here um, might want to know about. This is a, uh, with funding from New York State, we're launching the CUNY Immersive Research Experience. This will involve seven students at each of the four-year colleges. And uh, so kind of keep your eyes posted for notices about that because uh, students will be able to apply directly to that program through their, through their colleges. Now, working with Dr. Karobai would only be a possibility if you're a Queens student, but you might be able to, through that program, uh, uh, you know, sort of connect with other computer science or mathematics mentors uh, and, you know, so this might be a case in which you may even want to approach a, uh, a, a, a potential mentor at your college and ask them if they would like to mentor your, you through the SIRE program. Um, Tamor asks, how does that program differ from programs like CRISP? So uh, CRISP operates only for associate degree students. So at the community colleges and then at the three comprehensive schools, the SIRE program is very similar to CRISP, but now it expands into uh, all of the four-year programs. So it's also a great program for students that would be transferring from a, a community college into one of the four-year colleges. And I'm not familiar with the ESP program. Um, and then Stephanie, is the transfer to STEM program year long or just summer? Uh, so that is a year-long program, and the second year of that program will be uh, starting this year coming up. Uh, the uh, link for applications will open a little bit later this year, uh, but most of the applications will actually be done in the summer when, because for that program, that's for students who are transferring into either Hunter, Lehman, uh, Queens, or City College. And so we need to give students the, the time to decide where they're transferring. So do look out for that application link uh, also. So in other words, we have abundant, an abundance of, of opportunities coming up for undergraduate research. 
I keep checking the CUNY uh, Office of Research website from time to time. You can also uh, write to me directly at any point for information about these programs, and I'll put my uh, email address in the chat. Okay, uh, this has been a really good discussion, and I think you can see, you know, as as uh, the, the questions started rolling in, I think you've gotten everyone's attention, and uh, here's to many more good conversations like this one. Thank you so much, Dr. Carpo. Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Neri. Always great pleasure working with you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Absolutely. Take care. Goodbye.